Okay, good morning everyone. We're in the next Parsha Shavua, Parsha's Vayera. This is the second Parsha dealing with the life of Avram Avinu. Last week's Parsha, Avram went through the argument with six or seven of the ten tests. And now we move on to the final set of tests. The end of the Parsha dealt with Avram circumcising himself at age 99. And now as we begin the new Parsha, Parsha's Va'era, uh, Va'era rather, we, uh, Hashem visits Avram. And that's the beginning of the Parsha. Va'era Elov Hashem. Hashem appeared to him Be'elone Mamre in the plains of Mamre. So I'm going to read for you a few of the Psukim over here and then we'll, we'll analyze what's going on over here. Avram, Hashem appears to Avram in the plains of Mamre. And Avram is sitting at the entranceway of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifts up his eyes by Yar and he sees three people standing across him. Three people look like Arabs, heathens. By Yar he sees them. By Yaritzli Krasim he runs towards them. Mipesach Oel from the entranceway of his tent. By Yishtach Wartz and he bows down to the ground. Shows them respect. Vayomar and he says, Adonoi im no matsasi chayim beinecha al nasavor me alavdecha. My masters, if it pleases you, if I find favor in your eyes, please do not pass from before your servant. Pasabdalit, you kach no maat mayim. Have a little bit of water taken for you. Farachatsu raglechem and wash your feet. Vishanu tachasa eats and recline under the tree for shade. And I'll take a little bit of bread. And it will say, and you'll satiate your hearts. Then you can go. Because you have passed by your servant. So this is quite a long uh, plea to them. They say, So we will do as you said. We will stay. Avram Hohela, Avram rushes to the tent of Sarah, his wife Sarah, by and says, Mari Shloshim Kemach Solas Lushi Vaseugos, quickly, make some challah, make some something for them to eat. Well Habot Bakarots and Avram runs to the cattle. There's sheets on that table over there. He runs to the cattle. Bayikap and Bokarach Vatov, he takes a, a, a good choice cattle. Bayitan Alanar, he gives it to the young lad, that's Yishmuel. And he quickly prepares it. He takes butter and cheese. And the cattle that he prepared. He gives it before them. And he stands over them by the tree as they eat. And then the story goes on. They ask, where is Sarah? And she says, she's in the tent. And then they tell him he's going to have a child. And then there's a whole discussion if Sarah believes it or not. But they said she's going to have a child within a year. And then they get up and they go towards Sodom. Okay, that's the beginning of the story. So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of questions to ask over here. So we're going to have, there's like three series of questions. And I hope I don't dig myself too far into the hole that I can't get out of it. But hopefully we will. So, first of all, the Torah spends eight verses, eight psukim, describing the nature of the kindness of Avram over here. A tremendous amount of verses. Now, if you're familiar with the Torah and you read in the Torah, usually you don't get such detail to stories in the Torah. It's very rare. You have all kinds of other stories that even happened to Avram and others where it's just, things are just very briefly mentioned. But the detail of what he served them and, and what kind of food and, and washing the feet and all this, is, it's a tremendous amount of detail that is not typical of uh, the way the Torah writes things. For example, if you look in the first source, it says later on in the Parsha, there's a reference, it says, Avram, uh, let's get the, the whole verse, Wait, it says it in the Chumash. It says in Perak Chafal of Pasuk Lamed Gimel. It says, Vayita Eishel Biver Shava. He plants an Eishel in Beer Shava and he calls the place Hashem Kelolam. 
So Eishel is an unusual word. So Rashi, based on the rabbis, brings a dispute between two rabbis, Rav and Shmuel. They each interpret the word Eishel differently, but they base, one says it was an orchard from which to bring fruits to the guests, and another one says he made an inn. He made a, a holiday inn in the desert. And the word Eishel is an acronym. Aleph stands for Achila, food. Shin stands for Shesia, drink. And Lamed stands for either Lina, which means a place to sleep, or Levaya, or escorting them out. But be that as it may, this was a place that Avram built, a hotel. And it could be a hotel with an orchard. orchard. Could be the, the two commentaries complement each other. It wasn't built for a day. It was built for many, many years. Many, many years Avram was a host and he had this hotel for people to come to. And how do we know all this? From one word, Asia. He planted in Asia. That's it. And, and, there, and there's thousands of acts of kindness over years and years are hinted with the one word Asia. And here the Torah dedicates eight full verses to recount just one incident that maybe happened for about an hour or two. So there's a great imbalance in the styles over here. So certainly the, the kindness in the A shell that probably was, was for over 20 years must have been much more in total than he gave to the three strangers in this episode. So why is God doing that? That's issue number one. Okay, issue number two. The first verse says, Hashem appeared to him in Elone Mamre, in the plains of Mamre. What does that mean? Mamre is the name of a person. Mamre was one of Avram's good friends. And in the second source, Rashi tells us that when Avram had to get circumcised, when God told him to circumcise himself, he asked some advice from Mamre as to what he should do. Mamre said he should go ahead and be circumcised. And now Avram is, is sitting in that area, the plains of Mamre. God is visiting Avram. He's visiting the sick, recovering Avram. So because Mamre gave Avram the good advice, Hashem honors Mamre by appearing in Mamre's property. And this is Mamre's reward. Every year we read, uh, Hashem came to me in Mamre's area. Why? Because he gave him this advice about the circumcision. So the first question has to be asked, why does Avram need advice from Mamre if he should listen to Hashem? Hashem told him to do it. He's been doing okay without asking for people of her advice, number one. And if Avram needed advice, you know, why didn't he go to somebody much greater than Mamre? There were much greater individuals, bigger tzaddikim who lived in this time. For example, who lived in this time? Shem and Aver. The yeshiva of Shem and Aver. There were great people there. Could have asked them. Now, if you look in the third source, the Medrash Tanchuma gives us a little bit more clarification of what was going on with the story with the advice. So the Gemara tells us that Avram had three friends. Onir, Eshkol, and Mamre were the three friends. And when Hashem told him to circumcise himself, he consulted with all three of them. He goes to Onir, and Onir says like this, Do you want to incapacitate yourself? You know, you're going you're to be compromised physically. You know, you just had a war with the four kings last week. Remember that? There's a lot of relatives who are still uh, licking their wounds. Very upset with you. Oh, it would be a great opportunity for them to get you back in a compromised time of your life. So, and you won't be able to run away. That was his advice. Then he goes to Eshkol, and Eshkol says, listen, you're an old man. You're 99 years old. It's going to be a very serious surgery. And you're going to lose a lot of blood. And you could very well die if you do this. Avram then goes to Mamre. And Mamre says, he says, uh, you're asking my advice? Isn't this the same God who saved you from the fiery furnace? Isn't this the same God who did miracles for you? And you're asking me for advice? So now, for one part, for your whole body, you're willing to give your whole life up many times. So for one limb of your body, you have to ask some advice. You have to ask an opinion. Do as he commands you to do. Finished. So that's the amplified medrash. So again, there's a number of questions. 
Number one, so he had three pieces of advice. Two said no, one said yes. So why does he go with the yes instead of the no? If he's already going for advice, right? Um, also, like a, a better question is, it seems to all be a very sidebar to the story. The main story is he circumcised himself, he's recovering, the angels are coming and visiting, and that's the main part of the story now. The angels are coming and visiting here. Why is there so much play as to what, what went on with the advice, and who gave advice, and what advice? Um, and even more than this, it really should have belonged in the, in the past Parsha. In other words, the advice came about the circumcision. So let's go back to last Parsha. Last Parsha, there's a lot of text discussing the circumcision. We could have put somewhere a midrash that extrapolates from the Pesukim, somewhere about circumcision, the discussion that took place over there before the circumcision. Now it's like an afterthought. We're already finished, he's circumcised, he's recovering. He's now, Hashem appears to him. We're gonna have a whole new story about the angels coming and visiting him. So now we go back. Oh, yeah, you know, why is he recovering here? Because he did get circumcised. And when he did get circumcised, he asked for advice and this and that. And that happens to be the plains of Mamre where Hashem is bring him. It, it's all coming like from the back door. Should be right, right in the front door. It belongs in the last portion, not over here. Right? And, uh, and again, these, these details don't seem to be such important things related to the story that's taking place over here. Hmm. And the bigger question is, why is he asking them their advice at all for? That's the second set of issues. Now I go to the third set of issues, okay? So the third issue is, so three guests come. Now we are told they're really angels. But at the time they came, Avram didn't know. They, they were dressed as they were. Angels are very... Uh, uh, capable of doing all kinds of things, and they can manifest themselves in many ways. So they're manifesting as, as human beings, manifesting them as heathens. And Rashi tells us that there was a reason why there were three angels, because we know, uh, as much as Avram did not know, but they were angels and they each had a job. Each one had a specific job, and an angel can only do one job. Can't do more than one job. So in the, uh, the fifth source, it says that one angel came to bring the good news to Sarah that she's going to have a child. That was the angel Michal. Another one came to destroy Sodom, Sodom. That was Gavriel. And one came to heal Avram, and that was Raphael, because it was the third day after the circumcision. He has to be healed. So that's what three angels came for, and that's why each one has their own job. One angel can't do more than one job. So now, how many angels came? Three. Okay, so what did they do when they came to Avram? What did they do when they came to Avram? Okay, one of them is going to give the good news. It's Michal. One of them, by his presence and visiting, he will heal Avram. It's number two. What's the third one doing? <laughs> Destroying stone. Are they in stone right now? No. So is, he, uh, is, he, is this like a, a, a group passage or something? Where the angels, are, it's like they all go together. They can't go separately. I mean, couldn't, you know, don't you ever meet people somewhere? He could have, you know, he could have said, you know, the angels, the two angels could have said, you know, Hashem could say, listen, you two angels, you go to Avram, and uh, Gavriel, you go straight to stone. You go straight to stone. Now, of course, we're going to need, uh, Raphael is going to have a little extra work to do, because after he heals Avram, he's going to save Lot as well. But the real question is, so what did you need all three angels coming together to Avram when one is totally extraneous there's nothing to do with it right? what, what do you need the third angel for just to give Avram more work to feed another person his job is to destroy Stom so go destroy Stom finished you know, he doesn't have to come over here another interesting question is that this story took place it says in the heat of the day it was a hot day so Rashi, the sixth source, tells us how hot it was. It says that God brought the sun out of its sheath, as it were. Like, like they take a sword out of a sheath, took the sun. Because it was really hot. It was the hottest day in the history of the world. I don't know how hot, but really, really hot. So Hashem did this for a reason, as Rashi says. Because he didn't want Avram to be bothered with guests. Because usually on a normal day, there's a certain amount of guests who come. Avram is the third day of the circumcision, so he's in a lot of pain. 
So if guests would come, Avram would, gonna, would go and take care of them, and this would not be good for him. So Hashem wanted to give him a break. He said, I'll make it very hot, so nobody will come, and you'll have a break. You don't have to worry. Get a couple days off and get to rest properly. But God's plan, quote-unquote, backfired on him. Why? Because Avram saw that, uh, that, if you notice the post success, Hashem saw that he is standing by the gateway of the, of, the, uh, by the, uh, of the tent, by the doorway of the tent. Which, which circumcised man who's 99 is standing by the tent? He should be in bed. So what's he standing by the tent for? Because he's upset. He says, I have no guests. Nobody's coming today. So that's really bad. So since he felt he was, it says he was mitzvoyer, he was grieving. There were no guests. So Hashem says, "Well, I guess that plan didn't work. It's a pretty hot day. Nobody's coming. Who can come? I'll have to send angels. Angels are impervious to the weather. The angels will come. They're dressed up like people, and uh, Avram will be able to do the chesed that he wants to do. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was God, I could come up with a better solution." I come with a much better solution, right? How about you make the weather a little nicer, right? Which is an e I mean, we're dealing with miracles here, right? So which is easier to do? Just drop the temperature 20 uh, Celsius down to make it a little bit cooler, and guests will come. You know, we know there's a concept that God usually tries to minimize the amount of miracles he does. Here he's maximizing. It's, it's, like, it's almost as if he made one mistake. Now he has to make a second to fix up the first mistake. He has to even dig deeper into the hole. He made it really hot. Okay, so you thought that was going to be good. It backfired. So now i got to add, on top of it, i got to bring angels to make that happen. Just reduce the temperature. Said so you made a mistake. And, you know, like, so, and of course, it's all hard to understand. Hashem makes a mistake. He made a mistake. So it all is hard to understand. So that's difficult. And finally, if you look in the seventh source, the Talmud says that everything that Avram did in this story, the Jews got paid big time. When they went into the desert for 40 years, everything that Avram did in this one act, the Jews benefited for 40 years afterwards. And they give examples. And they said whatever he personally did, Hashem personally gave the Jews in the desert. Whatever he didn't personally do, the Jews got indirectly. And there's different opinions over exactly what was going on over there. But for example, it says, uh, Avram ran to the animals. So, and so he says, they, they, there came forth, a, a wind came down. Hashem quickly came and, and gave for the Jewish people. Uh, he took butter and milk. So Hashem says, I will bring down bread from heaven for you. The manna comes for this. He stood over them by the tree, like a tree, but under the tree, so Hashem stood before them by the rock. A lot of things w was happening. And Avram went with them to bring them on their way, so Hashem accompanied the Jewish people. Everything they did, everything they did. He did but he did say, here, there's some water, you can take some water. So for that, Hashem didn't give him directly the water. Moshe had to get the water by hitting with the rock, hitting the water, and then he got the water. So that was a little indirect. It didn't come from Hashem directly. The manna came directly from Hashem. Avram directly gave him the food. The water, he kind of put it at the side. He said, if you want, you could take. So Hashem said, okay, I'm not going to give you directly the water. I'm going to give you indirectly the water. Okay, there's, there's little debates over there. The Gemara goes on. Uh, but it's essentially the same idea. But some says for the three things Avram did, his descendant got three things. Because he took butter and milk, they received the manna. He stood over them. A pillar of cloud came over them. The Ananiah covered came for 40 years. And for the water, they said, you know, they got water from the well of Miriam. But it's the same idea. Basically, whatever he did, for 40 years the Jews benefited from that. So that's amazing. But again, the question is, so for one thing, you get such a reward? And what he did for the Aishel for 20 years doesn't mention anything. The Jews didn't get anything for that. Doesn't seem to be fair. Also, if he is inviting the guests, right, he's doing everything, so why didn't he bring them the water too? Why didn't he bring them the water too? And why does he, and why does he have them kind of sit outside by the tree? I mean, usually when you invite a guest, you say, I'm going to invite you from my house for dinner. We'll eat under the tree. I mean, you should bring them into the house, right? Seems it wasn't that hospitable either. Stay under the tree. I mean, so it's cool under the tree. It could be cooler in the tent. 
So, so that needs analysis. But again, the fundamental question is, why is the Torah giving so much play to this one activity? So the, the general theme that we're going to talk about today, as we know that Avram is the pillar of kindness. He is the one who really introduced kindness to the world. So obviously this whole story is dealing with kindness and we're going to learn a lot of lessons about kindness today. Now, let me preface with some very uh, scary words from the Chovos Havavos. The Chovos Havavos in the third gate of his book of Avodas Hashem, of serving Hashem, he says the following. You're not going to like this. He says, if you examine the kindnesses that people do to each other, he breaks it down into five general categories of kindnesses. Number one is the kindness of a parent to a child. Number two is the kindness of a master to a servant. Number three is the kindness of a rich man to a poor man. The fourth is kindness of people to each other. And the fifth is kindness of a strong man to a weak man. So he says... And I, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's a long piece. But he says, if you look at all five categories of this kindness that people have, you'll find that the people who intend to offer assistance are not really interested in helping the other people, but rather they're mostly interested in helping their own selves. He's very critical about humanity. And at the end of that section, he writes, he said, anyone who does something good for another person does it above all for his own benefit. He's saying, generally speaking, and now you're going to see how he gives some examples. This is going to offend many mothers, many fathers. He says, good, he's saying it. I'm not saying anything. I'm just reading what he says. He's a 10th century scholar. He says, when a parent is kind to a child, the parent does it for their own benefit. Number one, you want the child to grow up big and strong, so one day when you're going to be old, you'll have someone to take care of you. Okay? This was before the days of the RSP and Social Security and things like that. What did you do when you were an old person and you couldn't take care of yourself? Okay, if you're an Indian, they just send you out on a boat to die. Right? Or you make your own grave and die. They send you out. But, but in regular people, it's a big problem. There's no hospitals, there are no nursing homes. So what happens? And he didn't have to be that old to be old in those days. By the time you were 40, you were an old person. Right? So obviously, if you're good to your kids, they'll take care of you when you get older. Very self-serving. Uh, certainly, everyone wants someone to say Kaddish for them after they die. Right? And, and more than that, who will give you a sense of perpetuity? You're going to feel like you're, you're living forever unless you have children. And, you know, you notice parents are very protective of their children. You know, let's say if somebody hits you, you might not do anything. But if you hit somebody's kid, whoa, they'll kill you. Right? And a parent may very much, we'd say, loves their child more than themselves. But the Chobos says, so his wife, for your own benefit. And, and uh, he, sa he says, you might not like to hear it, but this, that's the truth. People have children, not because they're just wonder, such wonderful people, they're doing it for themselves. And, you know, historically, you know this is true. I mean, again, let's not argue this point. Um, 200 years ago, if you looked in the American West, uh, what was the average size of a family? A nice, secular, non-Jewish family. Seven, eight, nine kids, somewhere in, 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 in Nebraska, place. Nowadays in the United States, it's down to 1.5 kids, average. Okay, that's including all the Muslims and the religious ones that are having 8 to 10 kids. But it's 1.5. So like, what happened? What happened to change? If anything, we're more affluent today than we ever were. What happened to change? So the answer is very simple. In the old days, we had 7 or 8 kids. First of all, 2 of them died at childbirth. And another one or two of the Indians probably killed them. And then one probably died at, with malaria when they were 12. And then another one died. And if you were lucky, they didn't die. And you had four or five. Well, guess what? You had a large farm. You had a large plantation. And those who didn't have slaves. 
So how did you take care of the farm? Especially having men children was very important. They were stronger workers. I mean, it's good to have a couple daughters because you'd be able to cook and to clean. But this was really free servants. <laughs> You know, you had a big plantation, a big farm, so you had two, three strong, strapping boys. They were worked, they didn't charge anything, right? You had a couple daughters, one cleaned, one cooked, one took care of this, someone had to feed the chickens, the place. And it was a very practical, profitable endeavor. Plain and partial. It's not a question of love. If you want to be able to live out in the West, you gotta have a lot of kids. That's all. Couldn't afford to pay workers. But all of a sudden, people, things changed. And now you don't have to keep your farm. And now, all of a sudden, nowadays, children, instead of being financially, I'm going to talk like an accountant now, instead of being assets, have become liabilities. And especially if you're a religious Jew, there are tremendous physical liabilities in having a child. Right? If, you have, if you have one Jewish child, it costs you just to get them to high school, a probably a quarter million dollars per child. Okay, we haven't even started to talk about university, we haven't started about shidduchim and all these things. And even non-Jews, there, there's expenses over here. It's major expenses, clothing, this and that. Children are liabilities. So for what little benefits they give, okay, so I, how many do I need already? So I, I feel this sense of that, you know, I feel fulfilled. I've, I've, I've accomplished something in my life. I've brought another generation into the world, so my life isn't meaningless. So for that, you'll need 1.5. That's all you need. And a couple dogs and cats will make you find even happier, right? And that's what's happening. So all of a sudden, what, what happened? What happened? We love children less? What happened? You don't need them anymore. You don't need them anymore. So for what I need, my selfish needs can get by with 1.5. Make sure one's a boy, he says Kaddish. And make sure one's a girl, she'll take care of me when I'm old. Right? It's not, not you know, and this, was, this is even, this is so far true, it's in halacha. If you look in the commentaries in the halacha, it's, although it's interesting, things got reversed. When, when a baby boy is born, you make a bracha. What's the bracha make when a baby boy is born? Anybody remember the bracha they made when they had a baby boy? Hatov v'hametiv. Blessed are you, God, King of the Universe, that you're good and you bestow goodness. You only can make it when the baby is born now. Now if you think of it, it's too late. If a baby girl is born, your daughter. I'm not talking about... You make the bracha shechayonu v'kimonu v'gionu l'azmanazah. Now, hatov v'hametiv is a more powerful bracha because it, it's, it, you're good and you bestow good. It's a stronger kind of bracha. Shechayonu is a little bit of a lighter bracha. So the commentaries grapple with the whole issue. I don't really want to spend too much time on this, but you know, so shechayani, make a shechayani when something good happens in your life, so having a girl is a good thing. It's a good thing. But a boy is better. A boy is better. Tov mate. ooh, God is good, he bestows good, it's slumish gewaltik. So the commentaries say, this was written a while ago, this is not the only pshat, it's not the only pshat, so don't get hung up on this, but I'm just trying to bring out a point. They say, well, of course, you know, well, girl, uh, you have someone in the family. It's, it's, you know, if you don't see somebody, you know, you know it's just, if, if, you, if you buy a new house, you make a shechayonu. You buy a new uh, dishwasher, you get a new kid, you make a shechayonu. You know, that'd be for any kid. But, but for a boy, in the olden days, the boy is the one who's going to take care of you in your old age. So there's a real greater simcha, because you know I'm going to be taking care of my old age. It's interesting how now things have reversed themselves for some strange reason. And now it seems to be that the girls are the ones taking care of the parents and the ladies at the sons. Be that as it may, and I want to get to, there's more to that about the bracha, and don't get hung up on that. But the, even in the halacha recognizes that people have this uh, happiness because they will be taken care of later in life. So the Chobos Allah says, when you really talk about the love that a parent has to a child, for almost most people in the world, it's not because you're such a wonderful person, you're doing it for yourself. And his words are so true now, because I even had people, people ask me, Charles, not, not long ago, somebody not in our community said, you know, they have a number of kids, and they're not that old, and they were ask, they're saying, you know, we don't know if we should have more kids. I said, well, what's the problem? I said, you, you too, you're not too old. I have a couple of kids. So um, I said, well, you know, we're, we're just making it financially now. 
says, if I was doing really good, I was doing really good, and I had a lot of money, sure, I'd like to have more kids. But now that money's tight, you know, we really don't know if we should have more kids. So, so I, said, I said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, you have a job. I know you, you have your job tomorrow. I know you have your job. And God's giving you the job, right? So the biggest brach in the world is to have children. How could you not have more children? You don't, you don't determine children by how much money you have. God determines how much money you have. God will determine how much money you have based on how many kids you have. If you have more kids, I'll have to give you more money. It's not, it's not your children. It's not your money. Who are you to make these decisions over? It's God's money. It's God's children. God wants to give you more children. He's going to give you more money. But the fact that people, this religious people asking these questions, that means, you know, so it's not such a big deal not to have more kids because I already have what I need. I already have one to say Kaddish for me, one to take care of my old age. I don't need any more kids. And frankly, it's... So that's when you start asking those questions. If you really loved children, let's be honest, if you really loved children, why wouldn't you have a lot of them? You can't say, well, I only can love two. And you can only love two. And what are you loving the two for? For the same reason, if you love, right, you, if you love, you love steak. I only can eat steak once a year. <laughs> what do you mean? You can eat it every day. You love it, you have it every day. If you love children, you get more than them. You have more than two. The fewer they love, you have more. Right? You love money, huh? How about more money? No, I have enough. I don't want any more. What do you mean you don't want more? You love it. So, what's up, shot? You really don't love the kids, but we're used to saying it. It's very, it's very cruel words he's saying, but they're very true. They're very true, and that's why children, and that's what, what, from where else can you get the idea of child abuse? You want to tell me? Why is it all this kind of child abuse? Well, we love them. So what are you abusing people that you love? Deep, 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 deep down, we do it because, you know, people have kids, and that's all. Today's society is a lot more clever. They realize they don't love kids, so they don't have them. They don't really, you know what? We don't love anybody. <laughs> That's why we don't get married, when we don't have kids. We're sure not going to have kids. We don't want to have kids. They're, they're at least honest. Jewish people are still have guilt, so you know, it's a myth that have kids, so you have kids. If we love them or not, we still have kids. So this is a frightening thing. And then he, he goes through all the other areas. He says the same is true with, with that a master shows for a servant. If a master is kind for the servant, why is he kind to the servant? Because the servant worked better for him. If a rich man gives to a poor man, it's because he loves the poor man. No, he's a good businessman. He knows for a few bucks you get to go to Olam Haba. Here, here's my donation. Here's fifty dollars. Now, God, you give me Olam Haba. It's a, it's a, it's a cheap way to get a good benefit and a good reward. And even if, let's say. He says, let's say, the strong give to the weak. He says, because they have pity on them. They, have, they feel bad for them. Well, guess what? That's for your benefit. Because he said, how, how, uh, how could I eat dinner knowing that somebody's starving? Oh, so me, what's the thing? You're having trouble with dinner. Good. So now that I give somebody 50 bucks, I won't have indigestion. You're not giving because you love the person. You're because it, it hurts me to see the person like that. Very nice. It hurts you. So now what are you doing? I'm giving so stop hurting me. And what if it didn't hurt you to see the person that I wouldn't give? You know, a person's a good boss at work and is generous with his workers. Because he knows if it's a happy work environment, what did the, all these studies show? If the workers are happy, they're going to produce more. So he says, generally speaking, even with friends, you're good to friends, you're good to friends now, that when I'm in trouble, the friend will be good for me. One hand washes it, one back washes it out of bed, whatever. He says, you really get deep, deep down, people really don't love each other. Very hard to find this elusive, true love. He says, that's the way the world runs. How are we ever going to learn to do chesed? This is a major, major problem. I mean, something you should talk about, you know, wh why you love your spouse. Get a hold of this Do you really love the spouse? Or, or no, it's, it's a very good uh, arrangement we have. All of a sudden, when one spouse isn't living up to their part of the arrangement, something happened to the love. I don't understand what happened. Well, now he doesn't make so much money anymore. He doesn't give me so much attention anymore. She's not as attractive as she used to be, uh, not as funny as she used to be. We'll find someone else. Well, what happened to the love? So it must be, oh, I loved you as long as you were making a good parnasa, I could love you. And as long as you give me attention, I could love you. And as long as you're attractive, I could love you. And as long as you're my trophy wife, I can love you. 
So what, what happened? I'm just gonna say the love stopped. Oh, it's, it's, it's convenience. Let's be honest, there was a time where it was more convenient to be married than not to be married. Now it's not convenient, so people aren't getting married. Plain and simple, so there never was any love. It's very depressing, isn't it? But any, but this, if you really think about it, there's a lot of truth to what he's saying. Not, not, not that we're doomed not to love each other. The problem is we watch too much television, <clears throat> watch too many movies, and we have a goyish understanding of what love is. Love American style, love Italian style. It used to be a, a television show years ago when I was a kid, Love American Style. So American style is how you love. In France, they love this way. What well, about Love Torah style? You have, to, you have to learn the Torah, it's not a love. So that's, this is where Avram comes into play. Avram comes into play to teach us what is, and love comes from the concept of chesed, of kindness. It comes from kindness. It's one of the spheros. It's the highest sphere of the lower spheres. It's the higher of the lower seven. So Rav Dessler says a very interesting concept where he contrasts one concept called rachamim, rachmanis, mercy, versus chesed, versus kindness. He contrasts these two concepts. And we figure it's very good. If a person has mercy, it's very good. If a person's merciful, has rachmanis, it's a good thing. So in the ninth source, he brings from Pirkei uh, uh, Avistra of Nosen. It's a medrash on Pirkei Avos. So, it brings a very interesting difference between Job and Avraham, Eov and Avraham. It says, you know, Job also had four entrances to his house, just like Avraham, so that the poor wouldn't have to trouble themselves to walk around to the front entrance. And uh, it was very nice. But then he says, Hashem still had some criticisms of Job. He says, you haven't reached half the level of Avraham not half the level of offer. Why? You sit in your guests and the guests come to you. And whoever is accustomed to eating a certain kind of food, let's say wheat bread, you give them wheat bread. For the one who is accustomed, eat, accustomed to eating meat, you give them meat. For the one who is accustomed to drinking wine, you give them wine. You give them what they're used to having. Avram wasn't like that. First of all, he went out into the world and he looked for guests. Number one, he didn't wait for guests to come, he looked for guests. And whoever wasn't accustomed to eating bread, he'd feed them wheat bread, he'd give them wheat bread. Who wasn't accustomed to eating meat, he gave them meat. Who wasn't accustomed to drinking wine, he gave them wine. There were differences, there were differences. And Rav Dessa says this is the fundamental difference between a person who practices Rachmanus mercy versus a person who practices chesed. There's a big fundamental distance. If you think you're a kind person, this is the true definition of a kind person. What's the difference mercy and kindness? Mercy is externally motivated. When you feel terrible for somebody else's condition, their plight elicits, elicits a reaction in you you feel a tremendous amount of pain because you can't stand seeing a person suffering and you're motivated to help others to alleviate this pain that you have. And there's a term we call these people humanitarians. Right? So now the truth is a person who has Rahmanus is not necessarily a person who is a Ba'al Chesed, a master of kindness. That's not true at all. Because the person with Rahmanis is waiting to be motivated. It, the plight has to come to motivate. Him. The person who really is a master of kindness does not wait to be motivated. He doesn't wait to find out if a poor person is missing something. He looks for people who need. And that was Avraham. Avraham was looking for these people. He didn't wait to find out. And more than that, he gave them more than they were accustomed to having. Now, in the mystical sense, when you look at all the spheros, I don't want to get too much into this, but all the spheros work as a reaction to an outside force impacting on you. Every sphere, it's something outwardly impacts, now you respond. The one exception is chesed, is kindness. Now let's say gvura, for example. Gvura is self-control. That only can happen when somebody else has done something bad to you. Now I have respond by self-control. Everything is a response, except for one, chesed. Chesed comes straight without any response. It's, 
uh, 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 internally initiated and driven. You don't wait for things to happen. Now, if you have Rahman, so here's the difference. <clears throat> so, is Rahman is bad? No, Rahman is fine. But all Rahman is, Rahman is mercy. All it means, if you have mercy, it means only one thing <clears throat> that you're not a Russia, you're not wicked. In other words, if you don't have Rahmanus, then you're talking Russia. A poor person comes to your door and is starving, and you say, you know, I'm sorry, go somewhere else. You, it's not that you're indifferent. It's not that you're neutral. You're wicked. You're a wicked, terrible person. <clears throat> now, you say, oh, I feel so terrible for you. Here, 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 come have something to eat. You're not a tzaddik. You're just not wicked. You have Rahmanus. You're a decent person. You're okay, okay? But don't start thinking you're an amazing person because all you were is you were sensitive to your own pain. Now this is unfortunately many fundraising organizations that try to raise funds for handicapped people or whatever terms, I don't know the right term, I don't want to insult anybody, but you know, people who are, uh, have challenges, right? You raise money for them, it's an easier sell to fundraise, why? Because you're, 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 you're banking on people's selfishness to give. Because they want to alleviate their own pain. They feel so guilty. So because they don't want to feel bad, they'll give you money. So it's an easier sell than other types of tzedakahs, as it were. Right? So it just tells us you're in tune to what your needs are. It happens to be you benefit somebody else. But you haven't even begun to become a kind person. Don't call yourself a kind person. In the non-Jewish world, they're happy if you do that. They say, oh, he's the biggest humanitarian in the world. All he's doing is to get rid of his own pain. And if he didn't have any pain, he wouldn't have given. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, fundraisers try to find that angle to find the pain in the donor. What can I do to get the donor feeling bad so now he'll want to give me money so he won't feel so bad? Now, if that's the only way you're going to get the money, then I guess you got to do it, because after all, these underprivileged people need help. So you got to do what you got to do to get the help. Why, why do they resort to that? Because people aren't really masters of kindness. If you appeal to their chesed, most people will not give. There's a minority. There are some people who do have chesed. But in the general world of fundraising, it's, people just aren't you know, calling up, oh, I've got an extra $10 million to give. Where should I give it? I mean, generally not. You'll have individuals, but generally not. It's you got to pull it out of them. Oh, how big's the plaque going to be? Very big. It's going to be the whole corner of the downtown core with lights flashing, and you've got guaranteed for the next 99 years it'll stay that way. Now we're talking. Right? But, but that, that's unfortunate way most of the time it is. But, but in Judaism, it shouldn't be that you need to feel bad in order to give. A person should want to give without anything pushing them. You should be wanting to give because you're what we call a giving machine. So while Eov may have had a lot of mercy, Avram excelled in kindness, chesed, because chesed is truly reflecting God's nature. And this is the whole point. You have to give the way God gives. That's why the whole idea of the spheros, that God acts with certain characteristic traits so we'll learn to be godly so when God is full of chesed we have to imitate that chesed that God has now I want to ask you does God wait to be asked before he gives did you have to ask God permission to use your fingers this morning God please let me use me wake up your fingers are like this tight and oh yeah, Shem, please let me use my fingers. Okay, now that you asked, I have Rahmanis, I feel terrible for you. Okay, here, you open them up for you. That's not, that's not how it works. Do you, do you have to wait? Does God wait for you to be gasping for air? Thank you very much. Now, God is not waiting for you to be sick to heal you. Right? He gives it to you beforehand. The kind person gives without waiting to be asked. And it means you have it in you to always be giving. There's no external prompts. That's true chesed. True chesed, it's not a question what's in it for me. 
With true chesed, you're giving for only one reason, because that's the essence of what I am to give. Finished. And there's no ulterior motives. So the only thing you're required to do is to make sure that a recipient is supposed to get. That's the only thing you're supposed to, the only thing that delays you maybe a little is to know the guy's not a phony. Because you can't give to people who you're not supposed to give to. But other than that, if it's a, now of course there's lots of questions. Maybe you don't have enough money to give to everybody. Okay, then you have to determine who gets first, who gets second, who gets third. There's all kinds of laws about that. But the point is, what we're saying is, you know, and, and again, there's another interesting thing that comes out. We generally assume that when a person's giving, it's kindness, and if you're taking, it's not kindness. I mentioned this on Shabbos for just a minute. Usually the person who takes, we don't think is kind, and the one who gives, we think is kind. The truth of the matter is, that's not always true. Many times, taking is giving, and many times giving is taking. Let me give you a couple examples of this. Hashem can give you a great blessing of wealth, and you're taking it. But if I'm taking the blessings only to do and further the things that God wants to happen in this world, and let's say I'm taking a lot of that money to make sure to have another child so I can bring another ambassador of God into the world. That's going to cost another quarter million dollars. So of course I'm taking a quarter million dollars from God because I need that to be able to bring another ambassador into the world for God's sake. So my taking is really giving. You're taking in order to give. If on the other hand, if, uh, if you... Um, um, so what, but what about the reverse? Let's an example where giving would be taking. Let's say you have a friend who's sick in the hospital. Okay. You go to visit the sick person in the hospital, they're asleep. Well, you spent an hour going downtown to see this sick person. Now, there's certain people that want to make sure that the sick persons know they were visited. So you wake them up. Say, hi, buddy, I thought I'd come to cheer you up. I was sleeping. Yeah, but I figured you could use some company. So, you know, so what is the visitor really concerned with? The visitor is really concerned with himself. He wants to be able to say he did a mitzvah. Oh, how good I am. And how that person will remember how good I was to him. So here, when you're giving, you're really taking. Or, or another classic example, a person is sitting Shiva, and the sign says, Shiva hours, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Okay, you happen to be busy. You, and today is the last day of Shiva. Tomorrow they're getting up. And you all of a sudden notice at 9.30, you haven't been to the Shiva house the whole five days. How's it gonna look? Your friend, you didn't visit them in the Shiva house. It's 9.30. The sign says, then you go to the door, it says, Shiva hours, 6 to 9 says, ah, that's okay, I'll go anyway. And you go in and the person's been sitting for the last 10 hours and uh, you know, the person says, you know, I feel bad. I, I, this, happened, this happened to my wife years ago. I remember years ago uh, when the, she had two, uh, it's her mother's yurt site, her, her mother's yurt site was on Sunday. So she had two shivas back to back, two weeks apart, right? So there was a friend of hers who, who missed the first shiva for whatever reason. And then she, remember she came to the last day of the second shiva, the last night. I said, I felt so bad, I missed the first shiva. I had to come to this one. And she mom has kept my wife up till 11 o'clock at night. So, so I'm, you know, and I was like really upset. So I was, you know, that's why at every shiva house you have to have a, a relative who's the bouncer. <laughs> Let's make sure to get the nudniks out of the shiva house. Because all these people think they're doing a big mitzvah. They're not doing any mitzvah. They feel good knowing, oh, I did a shiva call. Well, if you really were good, you would have followed the hours, and you know what? And if it's after the hours, they really don't want you there, so don't go there. But what's the purpose of a guest sign this in a funeral? <laughs> it's a goyish stuff. <laughs> you, you it's, not, it's not a Jewish thing. You sign your name. To sign a thing. Well, you could say you could say the person will have a karasatov. He would have gratitude to know who was there. I mean, you should sign it. Now I sign only because I know people say, "Oh, the rabbi didn't sign. He didn't come." Then they get angry at the rabbi. Why didn't he come? <laughs> So now, now that they have it, you have to sign it, because if you don't, people think you didn't come. Well, this is gracious out. Who signs a signing book? What's that? Like people need to know I was there, and people have to send letters. It's, it's a mishigas. Now, the oval, now they have to go through all the avails. Now they have to write a hundred cards of thank you. They got to thank you for visiting them. It's a mishigas. It's a gracious
because they could sell you the stationery. And you're too busy, we'll, we'll hire someone to pay to do it for you. It's part of the professional services, two and a half thousand dollars on top of everything else. <laughs> it's, it's a goyish art, right? Yeah. Of course, we, you, you say, when they come, you say, thank you for coming. That's all. It's all, it's all phony. So, so you think you're giving. I'm giving. I'm coming to Shabbat. I'm giving. You're not giving. You're taking. You want for yourself to feel good. There's certainly an egotistical component that is involved with this as well. So therefore, you know, it's hard to tell who's the giver, who is the taker. It's a very tricky business. Am I giving? Am I taking? So we need some type of criteria to know how to get a handle on this. So are we forever doomed to not know if we're proper givers or not? So here is the start. The start is, and this most important point, and this is what you're going to see from Avram throughout this story, is put yourself in the receiver's shoes. You think you're giving to somebody. Put yourself in their shoe exactly, and you tell me if you want to get what you're giving. Okay? You are the person, you're visiting the Shiva person. Now you be the Shiva person. Okay, I, I am now thinking like a Shiva person. This person's been in Shiva for five days. And I know there's a minion at six o'clock in the morning. And they've been up since six o'clock in the morning. And I know the sign says to stop at nine o'clock. And it's 10 o'clock now. And you're going in the house. And you're looking and the person looks like a wet rag. And the person's going like this. Like you have a brain? Okay, now you're that person. Do you want that, that Nunnik visiting you or not? You know, put yourself in that person's shoes, mamish. And you know the truth is, I, at 10 o'clock, I hope nobody would visit me at that time. So even though I didn't have the chance to come, that's my tough luck. Send him a note, said, you know what, I, 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 I somehow forgot, I'm really sorry, and I didn't, and I didn't want to come after the hours because I knew it probably wouldn't be good. You know, so you got to focus on what the guest really needs and not on what you need. Now, of course, you're entitled to have a, a pleasure of knowing your... So the question is, so what is it? You, you, you're not allowed to feel good when you do a mitzvah? So the answer is, to a great degree, you're not. This whole idea, you had felt good to give. That's 90% a non-Jewish concept. Where's, where's it say you have to feel good when you're giving? And if you don't feel good, then you... Do that, because that becomes a criteria of how, why you give. I don't feel good about this one, I'm not going to give. You know, the person was so stupid to waste their money and do such bad business transactions, why should I go and help them now? Well, because maybe the Torah says you should. So, you know, saying I feel good giving, you know, that might be a nice idea, but that's not really why you should be giving. The only part you're allowed to feel good is this. I feel good that I'm doing the will of Hashem. I feel good that I am reflecting the way God would do kindness, which may not really feel good to my body, but my soul must be enjoying this. There's a big difference there. There's a big difference in what you're feeling good about. It's not that my, that my emotions feel good. That's, that, that's false. You never trust your emotions. It's I know, I, I know I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what Hashem asks me to do. And I'm reflect imitato deo. I'm reflecting Hashem. And that's the part that's good. And that's what Hashem wants me to do. But if you feel good from that more emotional point, then you've diminished the godliness of the act because now you're taking. You're taking in the act of giving, which is not the way it's supposed to be. So if you're feeling good about the chesed from the physical part of it, oh, I, I can now eat supper because I feel good about it, then you really were taking. So now we can appreciate, if you want to know really what chesed is, and you want to know what love is, now you look through these psukim very carefully, and you'll see everything Avram does is only focused on the receiver and has nothing to do with him. And you now study, and when you go home tonight or this week, you read it carefully, 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 every line, every word, and you see there's amazing things that Avram's teaching us over here. Now, how was he able to learn any of this? Very simply, last week's parsha, God said, Lech Lecha. Go, leave your home. What did Avram have to do? He was comfortable. He lived a very wealthy life in Haran. Hashem said, I want you to go now and, and, and go away and go find places to stay. 
in strange places. What did God force him to do? To be a guest. For years he forced him to be a guest. And then when there was a hunger, he came as a guest who was poor. And why do you think God did that? Because God said, I know deep down inside of you, you can be the chariot of kindness in this world. But you'll never be the chariot if you don't know what it feels like to have, have the shoe on the other foot. If you intellectually, as a rich man, think you're going to know how to be kind, you'll never know how to be kind. You're going to have to live like a poor man and you're going to see what other people's kindnesses are like. You're going to see how it feels to be made felt like a nobody and a nothing and a Rachmanis. And you're going to see these are all not the ways to do kindness. And then you're going to figure out from the side of the person who needs to get the kindness, what would you have wanted to have instead? Do you understand? And that's what the whole last partial was about. To know what is not kindness. And to be able to feel to be in the other shoe. Now that you felt the other shoe, and now that you're circumcised, which I don't have time to get into, now you have the Jewish ability to bring out real, real kindness. So now look at the story here. Hashem makes it a very hot day. I'll give you a break, Avram. You don't have to do any kindness. What's I saying? I can't believe it. I can't do any kindness today. There's no, there's no poor beggar begging for him to give. There's no Rachmanis welling up inside of him to give. Baruch Hashem, I have no nudniks today to bother me. No, he said, how can I live a day without giving? God always gives 24-7. How can I be a human being if I'm not giving? So he's standing by the door and saying, I don't know what's going on over here. I have to, I have to find someone. Not that I, I need to do it because I feel Rahman is for people, but as a godly person, God always gives. So by definition, I always give. And a lot of times, God gives all the time. He doesn't get a lot of nachas from the people he gives to. God gives a lot to a lot of people who take everything that God gives them and does it for the opposite of what God wants, and he's still giving without getting any nachas. And who are, the, who are the great candidates to come to him? You think some prominent people? Three Arabs who are idol worshippers come. He says, this is perfect. Because God would take care of them too. So I would take care of them too as well. And, you know, he, now, no, no, no. so now you have guests. Do you know, what if sometimes you're kind of, you're, you go somewhere and you're in a rush. And so, no, come inside. I said, no, I really have to go. No, come inside. I really insist. Come inside. Here, come on. Take your shoes off. Come over here. And all of a sudden, a whole three-course meal is coming. Really, I have to be downtown in 25 minutes. No, 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 you can't leave. You have to eat by me. Who's giving? Who's taking? Right? Sometimes you have like a mother-in-laws or mothers. Right? Who insist you eat in their house. Sometimes, you know, uh, you know, quite often my mother in law blessed memory, a Holocaust survivor, so they of course only knew one thing, no fall the end. You have to have give people to eat. That's all there is to it. You never know when the next Holocaust is coming. So a lot of times, you know, my mother in law would prepare these huge meals for me. Really I didn't want to eat it. But I had to do a chesed for her. I had to eat it. I mean the food was okay. But, uh, but I really didn't want to eat so much. But it was, uh, so she liked me as a son-in-law. I ate everything I ate. She got it, I ate it all. But, a lot, but a lot, I wasn't taken a lot of times. Some of that really wasn't in the mood. But I know if I didn't eat it, she'd be so upset. She'd be so hurt. So, uh, it's the biggest kindness I could do is to eat the meal for her. But so Avram says to these guys, listen, just come. You know, if you want to come for a few minutes, fine. That's why he puts them under the tree. He says, I don't know if you're in a rush or you're not in a rush. And I'm going to take you to my house. It's a whole big geschäft. It's a whole big deal. I'm going to, I could be putting on. I don't know. I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're in a rush. I don't know if you'll be at a downtown meeting in Cairo in another day. Right? So, so therefore, you know, just come by the tree. It's only out of your way. Like, it's not very much out of your way. Really, it's just right over here. And, and here's some water. I'm not going to force you to go and wash your feet. If, if you want to wash your feet, you wash your feet. And what does he say to them? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of bread. I'll give you a little bit of water. I'll give you a little bit of cheese. You know, that, that doesn't make people feel imposed upon. Now, while he's doing, doing that, he meanwhile, he's got a barbecue cooking in the back. And in case they want to stay more, then I'll say, oh, you really want to stay a little while? Oh, just so happens to have a barbecue going right now. And, you know, you do me a big favor because I have so much food, it's probably all going to get wasted. You do me the biggest favor if you would eat a little of that, please. You see, that, that's a whole different... In other words, Avram is saying, whatever you want, that's what I will do for you. I only have one need, is that make sure that what you need is taken care of. I don't need to have a reputation of being a good host. 
And that is one of the worst things we suffer from today. People feel they have to have a reputation of being a good host. You're cooking a Shabbos, right? We have to have three salads, five kugels, three types of meat, because I don't want anybody to say when they come into my house they don't get served like a king. So, so you understand? What people think, I'm, I'm the biggest balas chesed. I give so much. You're not a balas chesed. You have a reputation to keep up. That's for your own needs. It's, a lot of times guests really feel, it's, just, it's embarrassing, so much food. And then, and then and not if you don't eat at all, and then the guest goes home, they vomit when they come home, because they had to eat so much. <laughs> to, to, so, you, so you don't feel bad about this, right? Now, what you'll notice, so incredible, you look at the first five psukim, there's one word that's missing in the whole first five psukim. You know what word is missing? The word Avraham. <coughs> It says, and Hashem appeared to him, and he lifted up his eyes, and he said, and this and that, but there was no word Avraham in the whole first five sukkim. Why is the word Avraham not there? You know why? The answer is because the name represents who, your ego. And Avraham, when he came to do chesed, it's like Avraham didn't exist. There is no Avraham. It's only a guest. That's the only thing that's important is the guest. What the guest needs, that's what we have to deal with. My reputation is not important. And more than that, the more you give to a guest, the more the guest resents the giver. And therefore, what do you have to do? You have to make yourself almost invisible, like you're not around. And that way the person doesn't feel that he came on to you, that he owes you. And that's what I'm from this. Now we understand the details because the Torah is teaching us why so many details? Because this is the ultimate godly act of chesed that was done and was the first and most perfect, genuine act of chesed that you can understand the whole concept of godly chesed from these eight tzukim. And you need every single detail to know every little detail about being a kind person. And nowhere else in the Torah are you going to learn this Oh, you can say, wait a minute, he built that a shell, he built that big place over there, and it was a hotel, and was helping people, and this and that, and all these things. But the Medrash said, you know, that really came, believe it or not, for ulterior motives. It wasn't done for the greatest L'Shem Shemaim at that time, and that's what Source 13 tells us. It says, if Avram had not been jealous of those serving God, he would never have acquired heaven and earth. When was he jealous? When he met Malki Tzedek, after he had the battle with the four kings. And Malki Tzedek was shamed. He was a survivor of the flood. He said, what did you do to merit to survive the flood? He says, what? We did charity. What do you mean charity? There's nobody around. He says, what are you talking about? There are animals there. 365 days, 24 7. We took care of the animals. And because we took care of the animals and the birds, Hashem saved us. We didn't sleep. Sovereign said, Had they not done charity for animals and birds, they would not have left the ark. Only because they did charity did they get out. So if I do it with people, how much more so? Let me be charitable with people. It's going to even be better. At that time, he planted the Eshel in Be'er Sheva. So why did he plant the Eshel? Why? So it would be good for him. That's okay, Avram, you're developing this concept. That's fine. You're, you're, you're a nice guy. You're not, you're, not, you're not the master of chesed yet. Therefore, we only give you one word. You made an A shell. Yeah, it was for 20 years. That's fine. But that wasn't the real chesed that we want to learn for generations to come. It was very nice, but it's not what we want to learn for generations to come. What kind of chesed is he doing now? He is doing a godly kind of chesed. There's a God, there's, there's a human, human term chesed, which really means I'm getting out of it, and there's the godly kind of chesed, where I get nothing. It's just the recipient, and I'm not in the picture. That's the godly type of chesed. God doesn't give so he feels good today. You don't give to be feeling good today. That's the godly chesed. I don't exist. It's the recipient who exists. Then, you know, it'd be so much different in the world of chesed. So now we've got to go very quickly. I'm not going to finish everything, but I've got to finish at least a couple more, more points. So now why did we ask, the, what did we ask, why did the angel Gavriel have to come? Remember we asked that question? Angel Gavriel had to destroy Sodom. What's happening with this? So the answer is, before a judgment is rendered, everything in the godly realm has to fit in perfectly. 
You know, for example, if let's say God would normally decide to punish a certain person, but when he makes the whole calculation, he says, if I punish this person, his wife's going to be a widow, the kids are going to be orphans, he has a business that employs 100 people, they won't have any work, it's going to be really terrible, you know what, really he should get punished, but because of everybody else, I can't punish him because it doesn't fit to the entire scheme, then we let the guy off the hook. God will let him off the hook. Because has everything has to fit perfectly. So when God has destroyed, decided to destroy stone, and they destroyed, deserve to be destroyed, but there's one little thing that he has to finalize before he can finalize the destruction of stone. There's one side point that could maybe make that they don't get destroyed. Why is that? Stone, you know, Sodom is by the Dead Sea. Right? That's the eastern part of Israel. Avram's in Hebron. It's right about in the middle. Avram's right on the trade route that, that goes right through Israel to stone. You know what that means? Avram has a lot of guests. He has a lot of guests. Now that's really important to God because kindness maintains the world. As bad as Stone is, Avram is doing a lot of kindness. So now what's God's plan? Destroy Stone. They deserve to be destroyed. They're terrible people. But wait a minute. If you destroy Stone, what happens to the trade route? Nobody's going past Avram's house anymore. Oh, no one's going past Avram's house anymore. Where's going to be the kindness to sustain the world? That's going to be a problem. Avram's going to wake up one day. Nobody's coming. <coughs> So then I said, well, I guess someone's come, I don't have to do kindness. If someone would come, I'd do kindness. That wouldn't be good. It doesn't make sense to destroy Sodom at the expense of Avram not doing kindness anymore. So what does he have to do? He has to set up the test. His visiting him and bringing the three, uh, you know, that whole thing was all a test. He's visiting Avram and saying, okay, I want to see, I want to see what Avram's doing over here. Oh, Avram's standing by the tent. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, I don't have any guests. Oh, you don't have any guests. Uh -huh. Okay, let me send three strangers. Let's see how you're going to do now. So what does he see? So the angel that wants to destroy Sodom, he has to go back to God and says, okay, I made the final verdict. They are supposed to be destroyed. When will he make the final verdict? By seeing if Avram is the man who will still do kindness even after Sodom is destroyed. How will he know that? Let's see how this old guy who's 99 has just been circumcised, how he's going to relate to three Arabs. And what kind of kindness is he going to do? And that will tell us what's going to happen if and when Sodom gets destroyed. What will Avram do afterwards? Will he now run after and look to do kindness? Then it's justified to destroy Sodom. But if he's not going to do any kindness ever, it's not justified. So how are we going to figure it out? Let's pick it out of this test right now. So therefore the angel of Sodom has to come with them now. Because he'll, he's doing his fact-finding. And as the angel says, I found the final facts. Avram, I'm sure, is going to travel somewhere else and continue to kindness even after Sodom is destroyed. God destroys some with a good conscience, clear conscience. Okay, so now, so now you understand. Now you understand now one more thing. So now what did God do? We asked the question. He made it very hot. So why didn't he just reduce the temperature? So now you see an amazing new concept. When Hashem made it very hot and Avram still wanted to do kindness, things changed. In other words, he was, he was doing kindness all his life. Now God makes it very hot. So hot that most people can't go out. Nobody's going out. Aram says, you know what? I've been doing kindness all my life in a relatively natural way. I did kindness and it was good and this and that. But now it's so hot, nobody's coming. So now, how am I going to do kindness? God, it's really hot. You know what? I want to do kindness anyway. It's 150 degrees out there. I want to do kindness. I have to do kindness. God, you have to let me do kindness. What's Avram saying? I want to do kindness even under supernatural conditions. If it means I got to get a sunburn to, to have a guest, let it be. I have to do kindness because I have to be godly. I ain't getting nothing out of this sunburn. So now God's got, got two options. He says, you know what, you're such a good guy, I'll cut the heat down. But then when Avram will do the next, the kindness, it will be normal kindness. But Avram was already showing God he's willing to do beyond normal kindness. So once a Jew tells God they want to serve him in a very special way, God has to let them do it in that way. And therefore God says, if I see you want to do kindness in, in a supernatural way, you want to do it even when no human being could do it this way. And you're dying to do it that way, literally. So if I take away the heat, it's going to go back down to the regular level of kindness. And that, you are shooting for higher. So what does God have to do? He has to make another miracle. He has to bring angels to the only people who could go into such heat. 
And that Avraham would not have the kindness in the greatest heat imaginable. And that would be the highest level of kindness that was done. And that's what Avraham achieved. Not just any kind of kindness. On the hottest day where no human being could even stand. He has all the gusto and he's sick and he's doing kindness for what reason? For who? For a bunch of Arabs. Why? Because that's the way God does it. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Now, now that's what the Torah writes about. And that's what every Jew is capable of doing. That's what every Jew is capable of doing. This kind of kindness. And then what will happen when you're in the desert and the Jews are in the desert for 40 years and boy, you need a big merit to go back to your ancestors to be able to live for 40 years. So what kind of merit? A regular activity or a supernatural activity? It has to be a supernatural activity. So that's why it was this action that merited 40 years of super kindness in the desert. When a Jew goes beyond what he can naturally do, then Hashem goes beyond what he can naturally do for you as well. It's, it's an unbelievable concept you're seeing over here. You're seeing not only kindness of Avram, not only kindness, and what godly kindness is where you put yourself out of the picture totally. You just focus what is the best benefit of the recipient. I don't need to get any credit. I don't, need to get, I don't even have to feel good about it. As a matter of fact, I'm better than I don't even know that I gave it. But then he goes even more, and I want to do it even beyond what I'm naturally capable of doing. And when God sees that, he has to make another miracle to accommodate your, goal, your spiritual goals that you set for yourself. So there's no limit as to how far you can go. If you see you're put in a position where the only way I can do this is I gotta go beyond my normal ability, but I really need to do this because this is what it takes to be the godly person you want me to be, Hashem says I grant it for you. And then we grant all kinds of merits. So you can see a lot of times Hashem gives us very, very hard times. Because why? He's just trying to push us further. He's like, I know you could do kindness, but I want to see if you can do godly kindness. Why do you think you have people who will, who will, after you do so much for them, they go and stab you in the back afterwards? Right? Why do you have, you did so much for them and then you lose money? Why? Because God wants you to know for yourself, were you doing a godly kindness or were you not doing a godly kindness? to have your own litmus test. You know, you planned, you planned on having guests, and then look what happened. Out of town guests came, and then your husband got fired from work, and you're not in the mood, and this kid this, and this kid that, but you have the guests, so as, oh, I'm, I'm not in the mood for guests this week. I'm, I'm, I'm OD'd on guests. It's a hard week. Again, of course, you have to know when to say no, because if it's not good for your family, then you shouldn't do it. You don't do chesed if it's going to be bad for your family. But a lot of times it's based on, no, I really would like to have guests this week. Well, if you like to have guests or not, since when does that become a criteria? It's not convenient. What do you mean it's not convenient? Well, we already have, you know, families coming. So what's a family's coming? So you can't have guests because family's coming. So that's all part of, if it's, if it's a godly kindness, then it's a whole different perspective. And that is what Avram teaches, and this is what we have to work on. And then that goes back to how we would raise our children, and how we would treat our, all these other people that the Chosel says we don't really love them. If you really love your children, you have to put yourself in the child's position. Or better yet, put yourself in God's position. And he said, well, what is best for this child, not what's best for me. And what's best for this child, I only know by finding out what God feels is best for this child. And then I'll learn to love this child the way God wants me to love this child. Then you can talk to say you love your children. If you're focused on what they need and not what you want as a parent, then you're really loving them. And if you know that God needs more ambassadors and you're bringing children to have more ambassadors, that's the first step to know that you're doing it because you love them the way God loves people. So we didn't get to the friends, we're way past the time. God willing, another time we'll discuss where the friends came into that picture.